Hello, welcome to The Context, I'm John Barron. This week, as congressional investigators in the United States continue public hearings into former President Trump's attempts to overturn his election defeat, as well as his involvement in the attack on the US Capitol building on January 6th last year, we'll look back 50 years to the day to perhaps the greatest scandal in political history, Watergate. The parallels are fascinating, and some of those who witnessed both say, in fact, we are in much more dangerous territory today. Our guests on The Context include pioneering journalist Elizabeth Drew and Nixon impeachment inquiry lawyer William Weld. It ended with the only ever resignation of an American president after the greatest constitutional crisis since the American Civil War. It began with a bungled break-in at 2600 Virginia Avenue in Washington, D.C., the Watergate building. Six men in the pay of the Republican Party were caught here red-handed spying on the opposition Democrats at their national headquarters. 1972 was an American presidential election year. Republican Richard Nixon was running for a second term. Nixon now, Nixon now, more than ever, Nixon The country now. was divided, crime was up and the war in Vietnam dragged on. Nixon's rival, Democratic Senator George McGovern, was campaigning on a promise to end the war and bring the troops home, but Nixon was in an almost unbeatable position. Four more years, it looks a strong possibility for Mr Nixon. He's backed by the polls and the pundits. The betting is 10 to 1 in his favour. Even at those odds, Nixon's campaign didn't want to leave anything to chance. Good evening. We have a mystery story out of Washington. Five people have been arrested and charged with breaking into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee in the middle of the night. The five men were caught trying to install bugging devices. Two days later, a pair of young Washington Post reporters, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, reported one of the burglars, James McCord, used to work for the CIA and was now a Republican Party security consultant with links to the White House Committee to re-elect the president, known as Creep. Nixon's campaign chief denied any link. Neither the president, obviously, or anybody in the White House or anybody in authority in any of the committees working for the re-election of the president have any responsibility for it. Woodward and Bernstein kept digging. Can you give us any indication of the sort of pressure that you've been under as a newsman? Well, we've always felt that what we've written is true. Uh, we knew we were out there on the limb by ourselves because we had some information and some sources that apparently nobody else had. Woodward's main source came to be known as Deep Throat, later revealed to be the FBI Associate Director Mark Felt. In October 1972, the FBI revealed the break-in was a part of a widespread campaign of dirty tricks and sabotage against the Democrats. McGovern tried but failed to make it into an election issue. In November, Nixon won in a landslide. Still, Watergate wouldn't go away. The burglars were convicted, but the judge wasn't convinced there wasn't more to the story. An unlikely force in sustaining pressure has been a Republican appointed judge, Mr John Sirica. He was incensed during the trial by signs of official cover up. He imposed tough punishments, which forced James McCord finally to break down and start telling the truth. The thread that began with ex-CIA burglar James McCord led not just to the White House, but all the way to Nixon's Oval Office. I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. June 3. 1973, almost a year after the break-in, Nixon's former legal counsel, John Dean, revealed that he had discussed the cover-up with the president 35 times. Another former staffer told Senate investigators that Nixon had a secret taping system inside the Oval Office. Bingo. Who was the asshole that did that? He said, Lady, is that the fellow? He must be a little nuts. Yeah. Those tapes and transcripts, one with a mysterious 18 and a half minute gap, were subpoenaed. Ultimately, the Supreme Court forced the president to release them. They proved 
Richard Nixon was a part of the conspiracy. It was called the smoking gun tape. The president was caught approving hush money payments, obstructing justice and trying to get the CIA to impede the investigation. The House Judiciary Committee moved three articles of impeachment, facing certain removal from office on August the 8th, 1974, more than two years after the Watergate break-in, Nixon finally quit. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Watergate was about much more than a failed bugging operation. The investigations from Woodward Bernstein and other reporters, Congress and the FBI eventually revealed a jaw-dropping pattern of illegality from the very first days of the Nixon administration, including the discrediting of anti-war activists, undermining political rivals, even a plot to kill journalist Jack Anderson. This country doesn't belong to Richard Nixon. This country belongs to the people. And those... 40 Nixon government officials were indicted or sent to jail, including White House counsel John Dean, presidential advisers H.R. Haldeman, John Ehrlichman and Chuck Colson, former Attorney General John Mitchell, the planners of the break-in, E. Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy, and the security director of the Committee to re-elect the President, James McCord. Richard Nixon himself was pardoned by his successor, President Gerald Ford, and he spent the remaining years of his life trying to rehabilitate his image. As the Watergate scandal deepened, a young ABC Washington correspondent named Ray Martin was sent out to ask ordinary Americans about the investigations and Nixon's fate. Half a century later, we sent the ABC's latest Washington correspondent, Jade McMillan, back out to see how much people remember about Watergate today. Street interviews. Do you believe that Richard Nixon should be impeached? No, I don't. I yeah. do. I know. Yeah, I don't. Nixon, you don't know that sly is. guy. I feel that what he did um, has been done by all the men in political offices, and he just happened to be one that got caught, and it's something that goes on and is never going to be stopped. Because I think he should be impeached because of uh, his abuses of, of presidential power. Looking back now, how do you feel about what unfolded, and do you think that President Nixon should have left office? Yes. yes, he should have left office, for yes. sure. Absolutely, he did the right thing. It was thing. the beginning of a bad trail that we're still on. Oh, he definitely should have. I think people in political office are, should be held to a very high standard, and if they don't meet that, they should be immediately removed or step out of office themselves. The presidency itself, has that been tarnished? Has that been affected by the Watergate affair, the scandals? I think it has somewhat, but I hope that we can gain a new respect for it. Do you have trust in politics now? It's just, you know, that's a tough question. Not at all. Not at all. I'm a little bit cynical at this time. We need to really work to try to make sure we hold that standard. Have you reached a point where you disbelieved in the government because of this? I have reached that many years ago. I believe the political scene in the United States is somewhat is whoever has the most money, he's president. The people now are all aware of the way the industries and all the big money people, they run the political scene. I think this with the impeachment, I think we will start believing in the government again. I mean, I think long term it has. I think that it sort of started a new era of skepticism in the national government that has continued to grow over my lifetime. Politicians should be watched closely by their constituents, but uh, I think we can trust them, but we can't trust them too far. Trust is a very important thing to have when it comes to building a better society. Overall, I have a, a level of trust in them, and it would be nice to see that sort of level of trust more broadly restored. Thank you very much. That's everything. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank that you. Was so much, that was so much fun. 31. So, memories are pretty fresh in Washington, D.C. But what about closer to home? Do people on the streets of Sydney even know what Watergate was? Ange Lavoie-Pierre went to find out. Excuse me, hi, I'm from the ABC. Do you know what Watergate is? Do you know what Watergate is? Yeah. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. No idea, sorry. No. no. Who do you think of when I say, I am not a crook? Watergate is where uh, President Nixon uh, acted against the law. What is Watergate? Government corruption at the United yeah. States on a level that they'd never seen before. Yeah. 
Oh, you mean Watergate as in when um, Nixon? Yes. Presidential scandal in the US. The break into the Democratic Convention um, in, Washing in Washington. Do you know what Watergate is? Yeah, vaguely. Uh, some scandal that happened in America uh, yeah. some time ago. Right. I've got multiple, a multiple choice question for you. If you had to guess, is it dam infrastructure, a political scandal, or a cocktail? Uh, maybe the first one. All three. Scandal. Got it. When do you think you learned about it? I covered it for history extension in high school, so yeah. okay. I, wrote, I wrote a paper on it. Yeah. Uh, Miss Vince, that was my best paper I ever wrote. <laughs> You're watching The Context. So, 50 years on, does Watergate really matter? That's the question that I put to Bill Weld. He was the legal counsel to the House Judiciary Committee's Nixon impeachment inquiry. He went on to become Governor of Massachusetts and a Republican presidential candidate running against Donald Trump in 2020. Well, it kicked off a lot of things. I mean, uh, I was asked recently, how does uh, the Watergate break-in look to you compared to, for example, the incitement to riot uh, of the January 6 uh, events where the President of the United States is trying to get people to go storm the Capitol when he knows that they're carrying signs saying, hang Mike Pence, and he knows that Speaker Pelosi is inside. I mean, that's a, that's a lay down incitement to riot case, which is a five year felony. But uh, my first reaction when I got that question was, what does Watergate look like today compared to what went on and is still going on in the United States of America? It looks like a third rate burglary, which is exactly how President Nixon at the time described it, trying to minimize its significance. But compared to present day events, uh, it looks like a third rate burglary. It did, it did inaugurate a lot of reform in, in the United States, I will say that. So is that to say that there was an overreaction to Watergate or an underreaction to subsequent scandals? Oh, it's the latter. It's an underreaction to what's going on now. No, there was not an overreaction to Watergate because you had the President of the United States lying through his teeth to the American people. And I was right there when uh, the critical tape came out proving that Mr. Nixon had masterminded the conspiracy the whole time. And the next day, Barry Goldwater from the Senate, Hugh Scott from the Senate, John Rhodes from the House, went over to see the President of the United States in the White House, and they said, led by Goldwater, who was a hero in, in this context, said, Mr. President, you have zero support in the United States Senate, zero. You have to resign immediately. And he said, okay, where's the pen? You know, you think that would happen today? I don't think so. Your job on the impeachment inquiry involved listening to an awful lot of tapes of Richard Nixon. What did you learn about him, what he was involved with and what kind of person he was? Well, there's a lot of vulgarity on the tapes and uh, really unattractive uh, comments. I remember a couple about Jews, you know, nothing some, someone would say out loud, but in the privacy of uh, the Oval Office, they did. And they must have forgotten that the tapes were running. Uh, and when Alexander Butterfield in the hearings in the Senate said, yeah, we did have a taping system in answer to a throwaway question, uh, a lot of people in the White House must have gone gulp if they'd thought about it. What does it say to you that Republicans in Congress today would be very unlikely to urge a president of their own party to resign as they did with Richard Nixon? Is that a Republican Party change or a change in partisan politics more broadly, do you think? It's only about Republicans. I mean, the Democrats wouldn't let a presidential candidate or a president get away with one-tenth of the things that former President Trump has uh, gotten away with. And if you look at the hearings that the January 6th Commission is holding in Washington, that would be a laydown case for incitement to riot. Having said that, uh, both the impeachment statements that were carried to the Senate by the House managers against Mr. Trump were laydown cases for impeachment. Ultimately, 50 years on, is Watergate telling us that in the current climate, a Republican president like Donald Trump would actually have a dangerously free hand. That's exactly what Watergate is teaching us. Governor William Weld, thank you for being with us on The Context. Thank you, John.
The committee will come to order. Good evening on another extraordinary day. President Nixon, in a startling reversal, has changed his position on the secret White House tapes. Say, so you're a lawyer. Did you find John Dean a credible witness in the uh, Watergate? That you are not aware the recordings were being made. Well, at the best of my uh, recollection, uh... I think he's. I think he should be at the top of his of his glory right now, and instead of that, because of some political thing, they are, are belittling this man. Our next guest is one of the most respected journalists in America. Elizabeth Drew has covered politics for well over half a century, writing for The Atlantic and The New Yorker. A regular on Meet the Press and PBS NewsHour, Drew also quizzed the candidates in the 1976 presidential debate. She's also author of a definitive biography of Richard Nixon. Elizabeth Drew, welcome to The Context. Thank you. It's a joy to talk to you. In light of everything else that has happened in the past half century, is Watergate still a big deal? Yes. It, uh, it was a constitutional crisis, John. A um, number of people here, including some rather well-known reporters, uh, were treating it as a cops and robbers story. But it wasn't. I mean, it was partly that. But it was a constitutional crisis in the sense that the question was, could the president, the then president, Richard Nixon, be held accountable to the Congress and to the public? And we didn't know. It took a long time uh, to get there. It's very different from the more recent and still going ongoing sc scandal uh, confrontation with Mr. Trump, who went much further and tried to overturn an election, which is astounding and alarming. And they're going to try it again. But Watergate still stands as the first real constitutional issue of the president's accountability. And I think it, it should always stand as something that was very important. And the fact that in the end, Mr. Nixon was held accountable uh, is very important. Do you think that some of that significance was lost in the way that Watergate played out live on TV, in the newspapers, in books, in films? It kind of became a bit of a, a who done it that may be obscured that fundamental point? I'm suggesting even at the time, people were losing the meaning. They were treating it as a cops and robbers and who'd done it. And well, we know who'd done it. The question is whether he'd be held accountable for it. And uh, it wasn't understood at the time, I don't think. I mean, I, I wrote a series for the New Yorker magazine and I understood it as a constitutional issue confrontation, but that was not the general view, and probably still isn't because of the movie. It wasn't understood then. I think it's not largely understood now. But I I think I understand it, and people, the people who worked on it understood it. You spent a lot of time observing Richard Nixon and writing about Richard Nixon. What assessment did you come to? What sort of a man was he? He was a very interesting man. He was a loner. He really had no friends. That's something to look at when somebody's running for president, do they have friends? Or do they confide in people? Do people confide in them? Nixon was very unsure of himself. He sounds very sure of himself, but he really wasn't. And he, he believed in taking chances. There's a wonderful quote, in which Nixon said later to one of his aides after he was ousted from the presidency, or he, he resigned because he had no choice. He said, you know, you take your chances. He says, it's a piece of cake until you take one too many, and then it's a crash. And that's what happened to him. He was very secretive, very suspicious. As I say, he didn't have friends. Question of how much he loved his wife towards the end, I think he really did. We, all of us can remember if we were alive, watching him sobbing at her funeral. She died before he did. Uh, he was somewhat close to, he had two daughters. He was somewhat close to them. But he was a very hard man to get close to. A little reckless, not, nothing like Trump though. I mean, Trump has taken this much further. Nixon was a lawyer. Trump was a businessman who didn't even know what the constitution was and didn't much care as we can see. 
because he's so ready to, you know, overthrow it. Uh, so Nixon was more careful, and he was a lot smarter. He was a smart man. He wasn't wise, though. So if Richard Nixon was not stupid, but a lot of people working for Richard Nixon were stupid, can we say that he was just more crooked than other presidents? Because he argued that he was just the guy who got caught. Oh, yes. They didn't try anything like this. They didn't push at the Constitution. They didn't, they didn't break the law, as far as I know. Uh, they might have lived a little recklessly, particularly Mr. Kennedy with his affairs. Um, to this day, we still discuss and argue over who knew that, who knew about that and when did we know it. Uh, but there was nothing like that that had ever happened before. This is why it was so alarming. It was a very alarming period. I mean, my, my journals, it's called Washington Journal, by the way, uh, shows that it was funny and scary at the same time. And sometimes, you know, you laugh because you're scared. Or, and it was it was very scary because he, he, he had these secret police, so to speak. He had Ted Kennedy tailed because he thought Ted Kennedy was going to run against him for the for the next election, for the 72 election. But Kennedy didn't for various reasons. Um, he didn't get nominated. But there was no, there was, we felt there was no safety. I remember because I was writing about this. I guess we all thought we were pretty important. And there was a car parked in front of my house for like 48 hours, with some guy in it. And I called a neighbor, a friend who was also a journalist. And we were wondering, you know, what's going on here? Am I being tailed? We pick up the phone and say, okay, am I being tapped? And it was kind of a nervous laughter because we didn't know. And so it was scary in that sense, the enemies list. I mean, people kind of wanted to be on the enemies list. This is the White House drawing up a list of people who offended the president and who mainly was, it was a lot of journalists. And, you know, you really were important because you were on the enemies list. I was not, uh, but uh, people kind of wanted to be on it. Now, you know, so you have a government, a White House targeting private citizens doing their jobs. This is scary stuff. How far do you think Nixon would have gone? We've heard a lot about that plot to kill reporter Jack Anderson. Would Nixon have killed his enemies? I don't think so, no. He was not that stupid. He wasn't a stupid man. He was a smart man. But as he himself said, he understood himself. Up to, you know, he's saying, you know, he took these chances and it was a piece of cake until he, you know, went a step too far. So, no, he would not have sanctioned that at all. He, as I say, he was an attorney. Not, not all attorneys are angels, but he understood limits. Trump doesn't understand limits. A final question, Elizabeth Drew, on the impact that Watergate has had on your profession, journalism. Did every reporter then set off to go and find the next scandal and attach the gate suffix to every little story they came across? I hate that. Uh, not your question, I hate that suffix gate. And that was the invention of William Sapphire, who was a speechwriter for Mr. Nixon. And Bill then became a columnist for the New York Times. He's no longer with us. A very clever guy, very, you know, very likable person. But he has a clever idea that if you apply the suffix gate to whatever, knitting gate or God knows what, uh, it will diminish the importance of Watergate. And so people very sloppily use it. You'll never catch me doing that, but uh, people do, and it's, it's, it's appalling. Elizabeth Drew, thank you for being with us on The Context. Well, I enjoyed it. Hope you'll invite me back. Elizabeth Drew spoke there about the way the gate suffix was appropriated in the aftermath of Watergate and how that was a deliberate ploy by political columnist and Nixon speechwriter Bill Sapphire to downplay the Watergate scandal. And it was also an attempt by reporters and headline writers to elevate subsequent political scandals. First, there was Billy Gate, when it was revealed that President Jimmy Carter's brother Billy was being paid by the Libyan government. It looked like influence peddling and it didn't help Jimmy's re-election chances. Billy then used the scandal to try and make some more money selling ice cream. When I got $200,000 from Libya, a lot of people thought it was because of my brother. It's just not true. In the Reagan years, there was the Iran-gate arms for hostages scandal. Bill Clinton faced Troopergate and Travelgate, then of course Lewinsky-gate. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. 
In the UK in 1992, Camilla Gate revealed the long-standing extramarital relationship between Prince Charles, who was still married to Princess Diana, and Camilla Parker Bowles. And like Watergate, Camilla Gate involved some rather memorable tape recordings. Australian political gates have included Ute Gate and Chopper Gate, Homework Gate and Sandpaper Gate, and in 2012 things just got silly in Britain with Gate Gate, when a Tory MP swore at police when they wouldn't open a gate for him. So finally, William Sapphire seems to have succeeded. Gates all sound silly. It's been quite a linguistic journey for a humble suffix, as word nerd David Astle explains. Gate plus a suffix falls into that beautiful category of words that I would classify as being synonyms. Uh, that is, they're synonyms or useful tools that appear in headlines. So it has that skinny shorthand dexterity that you can suffix gate onto any corruption or rot or um, sniff of an affair. Suddenly gate has that perfect Lego clickability onto Iguana Gate or Ute Gate or whatever gate or whatever topic crops up. As is so often the case in journalism, David, it does seem that sometimes a quite handy shortcut flops over the line into becoming a lazy cliche at some point. It almost becomes ironic. I think a good example of that is from Armageddon to Sharkgeddon. Uh, what just happened? Um, in the same way that um, people are very playful with gate, I mean, Watergate is serious business, and so was Contragate and Irangate and Monica Gate and many other gates that followed. But then people started getting playful with it, uh, and the likes of um, you, you, all it takes is for Adani to be called Colgate, and we're as much having a joke with the whole, you know, political machinations of that particular story, rather than really highlighting that this is a serious issue we need to discuss. When that meaning changes so that it is now a shorthand for a non-scandal that's been beaten up, that's almost mission accomplished for old Bill Sapphire, isn't it? It is interesting, isn't it, how that... Um, I, often that, that is quite typical of language too. It's almost as though while Bill Sapphire was trying to uh, defang the word and the, um, the magnitude of the Watergate scandal, it's almost come around to mirror his, um, his desires because gate is so readily used that it's become a little less potent. Well, David, it does seem as though we have stumbled over overused suffix gate. <laughs> gate has become gate-ish. So maybe we should mark the 50th anniversary of Watergate by finally retiring the gate suffix. And that is all for the context. Next time, there's another milestone coming up, the 90th anniversary of the ABC. We'll be joined by two all-time favourites and look back on Auntie's formative years. That's next week on The Context. Thanks for watching. <laughs>